In 30 seconds, you will be witness to one of the greatest online events in the history of, well, online events. Descript proudly brings to you a topic that you deeply care about and whose name is the title of this online event. I'm Don. I am not your host. I am an overdub stock voice included for free with Descript. So, now, let's meet someone who actually works here. Hello, everybody. Good morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time it may be. It is always a good time for a Descript live stream. Hey, everybody. I'm Jay LaBeouf. I am head of business development here at Descript. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're first time using Descript, Descript is a tool that I need more coffee. Descript allows you to edit audio and video as easily as editing text. And it's used by some amazing creators, such as our friends at Pushkin Industries, such as my friend Eloise and LJ. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. So, so this week, we are actually talking about how Pushkin creates some of the top podcasts that you listen to. Um, first, to introduce LJ or Lydia Jean. Uh, Lydia Jean Cott is a producer at Pushkin. She's a founding producer of Deep Background with Noah Feldman and is currently working on the third season of Against the Rules with Michael Lewis, which comes out this fall. LJ also co-wrote Noah Feldman's uh, one of the first Pushkin audiobooks, Takeover, How a Conservative Student Club uh, Captured the Supreme Court. LJ, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm also happy to welcome Eloise Linton, also a producer at Pushkin. She's currently working on the sixth season of Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, Revisionist History. She's also involved in Pushkin's audiobook division, has co-produced numerous projects, including Fauci by Michael Spector, and also another Malcolm Gladwell audiobook, The Bomber Mafia. Eloise, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's start off with how you uh, how you each get started in this industry, um, it, just as a, a roadmap for for people watching, um, we want to kind of talk to our guests, hear a little bit more about their background, but then dive into the tools that they're using to create some of the podcasts that I described. Um, we're going to screen share Descript in a little bit, um, walk through a session, and talk about their collaboration and production process. Um, also. Uh, you can tell I'm still working on my coffee. Another little note to add in, this is interactive. Um, so your goal is to put in lots of comments in the YouTube live stream. We're gonna take those as questions. We're gonna pop them up on the screen as we go throughout this session. Um, to start it off, um, I would love for you to put in the podcast you are currently binging and enjoying in the comments. Um, we'll bring those up. My hope is that I could share those with LJ and Eloise, and that also everybody listening can uh, can see what they're listening to. Interestingly, I am uh, I, I should just type this in. Um, I am actually I just listened to an excerpt from Bomber Mafia, um, so I have some some more work to do. Um, but it appeared on my Cautionary Tales podcast, so a lot of good Pushkin crossover going on here. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think that was we dropped that in the feed. I think last week or something. Yeah, absolutely, and I I, I love it, and I can't wait to dive into that um, towards towards the end of this session. But let's take it back, all the way back to the beginning, um, or as early as your therapist will allow you to go. Uh, Eloise, take us back. How did you get started uh, in podcasting? Um. Yeah. So I came to uh, podcasting through kind of like an unconventional root. I was in, um, I thought it's happening, I think more now, but um, I was in television. Um, I was working a lot um, in the writer's room. Um, I was like the head researcher on a TV show that um, was a historical drama. So um, yeah, I was, I was researching a lot, working with writers um, and sort of being like the TV show fact checker, I guess you could say. Um, and then I was freelancing, um, working with authors, kind of also doing research. Um, and then I came to Pushkin uh, at first, like doing a similar thing, which is working with writers and researching. So, yeah. 
Awesome. Awesome. What, what would you consider the first show that you really moved the needle on that you felt like you were a core part of that team? Um, I, I probably, um, fa the audiobook, probably Fauci. Um, cause it was such a small team. Um, and we were doing like a totally new thing. Um, that, yeah. So, th so that's an audiobook that pushed that we produced at Pushkin, um, last summer. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. LJ, how about yourself? Uh, take us back to the beginning. What's, what's your background? Did you come also come from a TV background? No, actually I came from a radio background. Um, or actually I started by interning at NPR like almost 10 years ago. Um, but on the digital side actually. Um, but you can't really be in the building at NPR without getting interested in audio. <laughs> so I um, tried, you know, wanted to learn how to edit audio. Um, and I was lucky enough to be surrounded by the best audio editors and resources you can imagine. So I would stay late or come in early and kind of teach myself how to um, use the audio editing system that NPR has. And then I started working as a news producer for a year and then I kind of stayed in public radio um, working at NPR and then for a BBC show and then WNYC until I moved over to Pushkin. Oh, fantastic. You, you, when we were talking earlier, um, see, you were telling me you were a fact checker on Morning Edition and there was kind of an interesting way that you that you were able to start learning audio editing. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I was actually a fact checker on NPR's arts desk. So I would fact check book reviews, but um, it was incredibly rigorous. Like if a book review personal essay mentioned that they were caught in traffic on a Tuesday morning in like 1997, I had to make sure that there would be traffic that day. Um, and the way that I learned audio is that at a certain point I was only working part-time as a fact checker on the arts desk and I had a friend who worked at Morning Edition. And um, there would be empty desks at Morning Edition at random times because it's a 24 hour operation. So I would sit there and she would give me like the copies of the mixes that she was doing and I would do them kind of behind her and then she would listen to them and give me feedback. And then I would get other people to do that for me at Morning Edition. And then eventually I was just hanging out there so much that I think that the scheduler kind of figured I worked there and when they needed someone I was ready to jump in and I had been practicing for like months. So I was ready. Wow. Yeah, that's that, that that's one of those kind of almost a, almost a cliche, but like more people I think should should do is just kind of like just hang around the building and people assume you work there. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of showed up on the Rota one day. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So let's um, and maybe my final question, what what would you say is the the first project that you felt like you really moved the needle on? I think that when I got my first assignments at Morning Edition, um, I loved working at Morning Edition and, you know, the hours were crazy. Like they put the new people on the overnight shift. So I was coming into work at 11 a.m. and finishing at 7 p.m. But it really did feel like um, a master's in journalism kind of because you have to learn how to cut really quick, how to have news judgment and it's the kind of thing where you know there's no they kind of put the young people on the overnight shift so there are no grown-ups so we kind of had to rise to the occasion and it was really really fun oh fantastic well let's let's talk about where you are now both of you are at pushkin um this is this is this is a special conversation for me because i i believe pushkin produces more podcast content that's currently in my library than almost any other company, than any other company I can actually say. And so for people that aren't as familiar with, um, let's say, uh, uh, against the rules or deep background or revisionist history, um, I can describe that it, you know, it feels like, and you can both correct me if this is it's kind of hitting the mark, it, it feels like everybody at Pushkin is coming from a, a, a almost a journalistic background. Um, the shows are full of these, I mean, I don't know how many interviews are in a given episode of something, but it just feels like dozens of interviews, 
um, highlights from dozen of interviews, uh, incredible archival footage and tons of work must go into like cultivate the best clips to bring in that sets the scene. Um, so these are very rich and very complex episodes. Is it, how is that for kind of describing to our our audience like what a what a Pushkin branded episode might sound like? Do you want? I, I <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like it's hard to Pushkin up. I don't know. That's it's. I would say it varies a little bit between um, shows, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's a yeah very accurate description. I think. There are, we work with a lot of um, journalists and a lot of people that come from print backgrounds. Um, and um, yeah, some shows are like more interview heavy and some shows are more like archival um, clip heavy. And uh, we definitely like, you know, take a lot goes into the production process behind the scenes. And we put a lot of like care into the creation of the product before it's released out into the world, I would say that's that's pretty much the Pushkin mark. What would you say? Would yeah, you say that, LJ? I would say that's right. And I would also say, and Eloise, you can talk more about this as well, that one of Pushkin's trademarks is it's very, I feel like we're a very literary podcast company um, and Pushkin really values the, the writing and we have a lot of hosts who are writers. Um, so that's another another Pushkin mark. Definitely, yeah. Great, great. So let's let's talk about a um, let's talk about your editing workflow on some of the shows that you work on, and feel like there's there, there's kind of two two marks here. There's before Descript entered, and now that you're using Descript. So um, first, tell me about a show that you've worked on and what the editing workflow was before you were using Descript. You know, and if possible, if you can talk about like. What are the tools? What was the flow for a typical episode? Um, I can, I mean, we, so it's kind of, it's different for each of us because um, one of the shows Audley works on is uh, more, deep background is like more interview focused and the process I think is a tiny bit different. So I guess we can both kind of like go through um, the process, but we pretty much um, before Descript used Google Documents. So we would create, um, the host would create a script um, in Google Documents and the editing process um, went on sort of back and forth uh, in that document. Um, and then um, from that Google document, the mix was created in Pro Tools. Um, and then our editor would listen to the mix and make her edits back on the Google document. So it was back and forth between Pro Tools and Google Docs. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then the finished product was exported from Pro Tools. That was pretty much our process. Got it. So, um, so it would start with all of the interviews would be transcribed. That would be kind of step one. Right. Sorry. Yeah. So, so we would start. Uh, we use Rev, a transcription service, um, okay. and uh, you know the host got all of his um, interviews transcribed. Would pull together um, those interviews, the clips that he wanted, with the narrative copy that he wanted in between those clips um, onto a single Google document. And that's where the editing would happen. Yeah. So that was Got before it. Descript. Um, and now um, we, so it starts the same way. So um, everything is pulled together. We still use Rev. Um, everything is pulled together in um, a Google document, but then the mix is created in uh, Descript. So I'm looking at the Google document and sort of using it as like a blueprint for um, how to, you know, create the exact same edits and um, then I'll export a mix through Descript and we actually don't move over to Pro Tools until we add um, narration. So until like we're totally done editing the content of the mix. Yeah. Great, Gr great, great. So, you know, you're, you're very focused on the on the script and on the words, which is why, again, everything seems like, it, like, like the, the Descript way of editing seems like it is kind of made for the way that you worked. Because if you were so Google Docs heavy before, now you can still see that and collaborate on the script. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that comes with working with like a lot of uh, writers and people who come from like the print world. It's just a very focused, uh, the process, at least, I. 
in, at Pushkin is very focused on like the script and um, the relationship between the editor and the host. Um, and that's like, you know, and we're all, we're all commenting on the script as well, but um, yeah. And I think Descript is great in that way because it, it already sort of does that for you. It's like sort of um, combining the, this, the pr two processes we had going like separately parallel at the same time, it combines them, which is really great. Oh, great. Uh, LJ, how does that, uh, how does that differ from deep background? Yeah. So yeah, for one of the shows against the rules I work on, which is also a more narrative show, it's exactly the same slash we are going to be modeling what we're doing for season three, because for the first two seasons, we didn't have Descript on what Eloise is doing. So we're following in her footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> he just gave us a training actually. Um, and then for a deep background, which is an interview show, um, the way, the main difference is the turnaround is much quicker and there's just, it's built around one interview. Um, so the way it used to work is that the host would do the interview. We would send the interview through Rev. I would use Pro Tools. I would make cuts to the Rev transcript and then make sure they match in the Pro Tools. I would make cuts in the Pro Tools and then make sure that they match in the Rev transcript. I would have my manager um, slash editor of the show go through the transcript while listening to the audio, then she would make suggestions in the transcript that I would then make in the audio. And then of course, the script has gotten rid of many of those steps. And now um, I was pretty much about to transition off of Deep Background by the time we got to script. So I just did it a few times, but I know that the producer, they're still using it. And what you do is um, we would upload the transcript into Descript make the cuts there. When my manager would go through, she would also just make the cuts straight into Descript. Um, and we would just upload it into Pro Tools to do like a final cleanup, but um, way fewer steps for sure. Awesome. Well, let's let's actually uh, pop, up, pop up Descript for, I believe this is an episode of Against the Rules. So, Walk me through what am I what am I looking at here? I love looking at uh, real world sessions. Yeah, so this is um, a bonus episode of Against the Rules that just dropped at the beginning of this month, and it's kind of like a promo of Michael Lewis's new book, The Premonition, which is about um, people who knew that the pandemic was coming and were trying to stop it, but they weren't able to. No one was listening. Um, and Michael is currently in the middle of a very um, busy and packed media tour. And um, in the podcast feed, we dropped a chapter of the book that he read along with um, some tape of the people that he interviewed. And then he also wanted to do this thing where he um, interviewed himself because he's been getting asked, like he's getting asked all of these questions, but um, this was kind of an opportunity for him to get to ask himself the questions that he thought that he wouldn't get asked on the book tour, it doesn't usually get asked. Um, so what you're looking at is the audio of Michael Lewis interviewing Michael Lewis about his book. <laughs> awesome. And um, yeah, go ahead. Let's listen to a, to a minute of that, if that's okay. Good to see you, Michael. Uh, it's been too long. So, what I like to do is ask you the kind of questions that you don't get asked that often. You get asked all the same questions on a book tour and you get sick of answering them, I bet. And so first, it's kind of insulting. We know from your biography that you got a, a D in biology your sophomore year in high school and that you wiggle through the science requirement in college by taking a course called Physics for Poets. And you were so insecure about it that you took it pass fail and you flunked. So you have established that you aren't the go-to guy for matters of science. What business do you think you have writing a book about a virus? You don't know me as well as you think you know me, all right? Yes, I did poorly in high school in biology, and I didn't do well in physics in college. But I actually got my start as a writer on the science pages of The Economist. And I think... 
it's true that I'm nobody's idea of a scientist. No one would hire me in their lab. I could never have had a career in science. But there's a funny kind of advantage to having no clue about the subject when you enter it, because you're in the state of the mind of many readers. And so... It... Wow. <laughs> this is an itch interesting format. <laughs> it's fun. Um, so yeah, so if you look at it, you can kind of see how um, Catherine um, and I work together on this, where um, she would kind of put comments on things that I cut, um, and then some of these cuts are my cuts, and then some of those cuts are her cuts. Um, and then the process for this was then we um, exported it into Pro Tools after we were happy with this final cut. Um, and Catherine actually put some like sound effects on Michael's voice. So Michael interviewing Michael sounds a little bit different than Michael answering Michael in the final version. Oh, great. So, and is that, you know, I, I actually, I see, I see you're both you're both in this document right now, and I'm in here as well. Is that is that how you typically work, where you're both in the session at the same time? Usually, I will be. Usually, we're not. Usually, I one of us does a. I'll do a pass, and then I'll let Catherine know that I'm done with my pass, and then she'll go in, and then she'll do her pass. Awesome, awesome. And what about uh, I? I see you're you know, for people that uh, are astute Descript users, you'll notice that this is strike through or ignored text. Um, but then you have a blend of that versus things that are deleted. How do you how do you choose between whether you want to ignore something or here where it looks like you've clearly deleted stuff? Yeah, I ignore stuff that I feel like is an editorial decision. Um, and then I'll delete if it's a stumble or something that I feel like is non non arguable, really. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. El Eloise, is that is that a convention you use as well? Um, yeah, yeah, because I because we go through so many versions of the script, especially on a narrative show where like sometimes you'll pull something back in um, that had been edited out earlier. Um, like the, if it's an editorial decision, yeah, usually um, I'll do the exact same thing. Great. Great. Yeah, this is pretty. It's it's pretty clear. I feel like I can open this, and um, you, know, you have some. You had some really uh, e e even even just here. Um, where was it? Uh, you had one one edit here where, like, the fact that you could even pull this off of the I could never have in my career in science, like. That was that, that that came across so cleanly. No one would hire me in their lab. I could never have had a career in science. But there's a f that that's great right there. I love that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, first question coming in: uh, Do you record the voiceover slash narration into Descript or into Pro Tools? So yeah, maybe you can tell me. Uh, it, maybe in the case of Michael, um, where was Michael recording his interview with himself? Um, so he records from a studio, um, and then we get sent the audio from the engineer from the studio in Berkeley. Um, and then, yeah, we upload it into, into the script. Oh, you do? Oh, I didn't know that. Awesome. Uh, and what about, what about other shows that, that you all work on? Do you know what the, especially with, with, uh, people doing more production remotely where they're recording? Yeah, how do you guys do it, Eloise? Um, oh, we're usually with Malcolm. He was recording from his like office. He built like a little tent um, with like cushions to, um, yeah, make the sound better. But um, now he's recording from a studio, and we pull it into. We, we haven't tried pulling his narration into um, Descript. We're pr pulling it into Pro Tools. Um, but yeah, that's something to try. Yeah, I mean, because this is an interview. We pulled it into right. district, but we haven't yet done a mix with narration for the season of Against the Rules. Oh, right. Yeah, we've done interviews into just Descript, yeah. Awesome. Great. So for, for those that haven't seen it before, um, I can just click, and I promise I will not add anything, but I can just click on the microphone and then choose the microphone that you want. In this case, I can 
have my mic here, and then I'm basically one button press away from recording directly into Descript. And the nice part is it it actually will do the live transcription for you automatically. So um, everything you do will just appear on screen totally as is. Uh, is it easy to bring an entire script into Descript um, rather than, uh, so basically they're talking about the rev going into Descript workflow. So let's, that's a great question. Um, uh, do you, you all want to explain it? And then I can, I could actually show what happens, how it happens in Descript too. Yeah, I think that's another one that since you've been working more on Mixus, Eloise, I know you have, you were just showing me how you did that. Yeah, um, yeah, so it works um, really well. I I actually have stopped doing, I've been using more um, of Descript's automated transcription um, since we're not actually like using uh, Descript as our transcript, so it doesn't need to match perfectly, but it's very easy to import what you do is you you upload the audio, the file, and then um, instead of automated transcription, you you import a transcript, um, and then it will automatically match um, the tran the the transcript that you had done somewhere else to the audio that you've imported. Um, yeah, which is really it's very fast. Awesome. So just to show an example, um, if I take you know take this file. And you know, if I say I would like to uh, transcribe the file, um, the default it, down here in the lower right is to transcribe the file and create a composition. But if you ever wondered what the other options were, click on the word automatic and you can see it, import transcript. So this is where if you do have an external transcription provider that you've used, or maybe um, you know the way that Pushkin uses it, I understand, you know, you do a lot of transcriptions and you already have a contract with Rev and you know you you like how they do it. So now with this, you can actually import this and now this window just pops up. Quite literally, all you have to do is copy and paste the transcript from your third party transcription service and Descript will go through and automatically align everything for you. Um, also, one other thing to note is there's, that doesn't count towards your transcription hours. So for you know whatever plan you're on, the automatic alignment is totally free. And I'll uh, clean this file up that I added in and there you go. Awesome, great question, thank you for asking. Awesome, are there any other questions while, uh, while we're here or we can keep going on too? Uh, so yeah, the question is, does push, should, should I read, does Pushkin producers use a DAW in addition to Descript? And yeah, we use Pro Tools as well. And can you can you talk a bit about um, talk a bit about what what you're using Pro Tools for? Like, what what would an episode sound like if it was you know in your case your episodes if you just said nope export right out of Descript? What do those sound like versus what's done in Pro Tools? Um, I tend to use Descript more for um, like rougher edits, like conceptual edits, if you're moving things around, um, and then Pro Tools for the finer edits. So I don't spend that much time in Descript, like cleaning up stumbles necessarily. Like I'll, as you see, I do it occasionally if one is really bothering me, um, but that's something that I'll focus more on in Pro Tools. Um, and then Catherine, who is um, the managing producer on Against the Rules, like, she does all sorts of fancy things in Pro Tools that are like way beyond me, like how she transformed Michael Lewis into two different people. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. By using, yeah, all of the like sound, special sort of sound design and scoring. And it's really what we export is like a rough mix. Um, and sometimes we'll do what's called like a scratch mix, which is used to be where we would have a producer read um, Malcolm's voice. So like I would read the narration, <laughs> or we would get um, our lead producer, Jacob Smith, to read the narration because he sounds, his like tone is more like Malcolm's. Um, but we tried using Robot Malcolm for the first time the other week. <laughs> so that was our scratch mix. It was um, his overdub voice. Wow. Uh, and how'd that go over? 
Um, it was great. I mean, it's kind of crazy to hear, um, but it, so this, the purpose of a scratch mix is really just for our um, editor to like get a sense of if the story is working. Um, and for that purpose, it's really great because it's, you know, it's about the content. Um, it can't mimic like his tone um, and stuff like that, but yeah. Awesome. Works well. Awesome. Yeah. It, I, it's something that, you know, I really think every every host at some point um, should create their own overdub voice just to give their teams the flexibility to kind of try things out with their voice. Um, and the day will come when you have to make that one obvious editorial correction. You know, when you said that something occurred on a, you know, I was in traffic on a Tuesday and you're like, oh, no, 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 it was Wednesday. But you don't want to have to go back into the studio to re-record yeah, yeah, I can see that potentially saving me a lot of time as someone who has gone through sessions and tried to find like the one, like <laughs> trying to create words through um, just moving around audio. It'd be helpful to have a robot. Awesome, awesome. What what features do you find most helpful? Um, uh, start with you, Eloise. It, if you were sitting down with someone for the first time or, you know, for people that are watching this stream, they're, they're just getting started in creating a podcast. What do you think they need to know about? What should they not miss with Descript? Um, for me, the automated transcription is huge because a big part of my job is like uh, listening through all of the material and audio that we have and also like finding archival audio and then sort of finding those like golden moments that will um, help make the, the piece come alive. And um, since you can, it used to be that I would, you know, be looking through old transcripts where you couldn't search anything or just like watching um, old movies or whatever. Um, and now that there's this really fast automated transcription that's searchable, um, that just makes that entire process um, so much easier. Um, and I can, you know, even present the editor with like multiple options and she can listen to them and yeah, that's, I would say, has has saved me a lot of time. Awesome. LJ, what do you think? Yeah, what? I would say, I would echo Eloise, <laughs> same thing. Awesome. Now, uh, I've noticed uh, on the left side of the, uh, of the screen, um, you have a wonderful system for organizing your content. Um, Thank you, Bart. Perfect. <laughs> We're on the same page. Oh, hi, Bart. <laughs> I know we worked on Fauci together. Cool. So Bart wants to know, uh, or maybe it's even a leading question. Bart wants you to talk about how you're organizing your compositions and folders and stuff. Uh, yeah. So um, I feel like it's, um, if you look at it, um, mm -hmm. it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's just something I started doing. So this is the first narrative show that I've worked on with Descript. Um, so I kind of created an episodes folder. And within that, um, you can see I've dragged in all of the every all the material that we need for the premonition, which we are thinking of as episode zero. Um, and then we're in the middle of working on episode one. Um, so what I've done there is I've dragged in all of the interviews that Michael conducted that are going to be in episode one. Mm -hmm. And um, that way, when he sends us the script, I'll know to look in the episode one, the L6 expert folder, and I'll find all the clips that I need there. Um, right. We also keep track of our meetings. So I have a folder for that. Pre-interviews are usually things that I don't think anyone looks at that folder except for me. <laughs> Those are just interviews that I've conducted um, to see if they would be good people for um, the season. And then, um, yeah just bonus stuff, archival stuff that like, I'm not quite sure how we'll use and where it'll, where it'll go. That's great. And uh, I, I love seeing people using the folder structure as we had hoped it would be used. <laughs> um, yeah, Eloise, does this, does this look similar to your projects as well? Yeah, definitely. I actually didn't think of, um, using Descript for our meetings, but that's a good idea. But yeah, it looks, it's um, very similar. We, I also have like um, 
bigger project folders. So like for the different, if different projects I'm working on, so like revisionist history, and then there's a different project, I'll have a whole different folder. I mean, you know, what, what are they called projects? Yeah, a different projects. Folder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Bart, for uh, for asking the question that was on my mind too. Uh, so, all right. So we're we're going to be opening it up to more questions in a little bit. Um, I do have a couple more questions I want to make sure we hit upon, though. Um, one of which being, you know, when we were when we were talking earlier uh, before this session, Eloise, I, th I think you had mentioned, you know, that some of the work that Pushkin's working on is blurring the lines between print and audio. And um, we even talked about the Fauci audiobook as an example. Um, certainly Bomber Mafia is probably another example. Can, can you explain more about what you mean by blurring the lines between print and audio? Yeah, um, so there've been a lot of these projects at Pushkin. Um, LJ worked on a uh, co-wrote Takeover with Noah Feldman. Was, we've done a bunch of audiobooks, Bart Warshaw and Karen uh, Shakurgi, uh you know, produced uh, Fauci with me along with Michael Spe uh, Michael Spector was the writer of an original New Yorker article. And that was uh, transformed into sort of this audio book without um, an actual book. So it was basically an, an audio book based on an article with no um, text to go with it. Um, and then Bomber Mafia, which was, um, which I produced with Jacob Smith was basically started as only audio and then later we transformed into a book. So it's sort of all of these, uh, uh, I guess, sort of amalgamations of um, print and audio that uh, Pushkin is experimenting with that just feels like it's kind of um, exploring the medium of audio in a new way. Um, I think storytellers um, can feel like, or I don't know, I think the invention of new technology and also just uh, podcasting becoming more popular um, sort of opened up the idea of audio as a as a medium that uh, storytellers could use even if you're used to writing. Um, and I think, yeah, technologies like Descript make, make that transition easier and I think more accessible. Um, and I think there's things that you can do in audio that you really can't do in print. Um, and that discovery um, for I think writers and uh, hosts is a lot of fun to play with and um yeah so it's 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 sort of like interesting to play between the two mediums does awesome. that answer your question is that sort of what we had discussed? <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yes no no that I, I mean i'm starting to see it i'm starting to see it everywhere now that like i take that lens and also um I mean, are, are you both involved in, in video as well? Because that's that's also something that we're seeing more and more podcasters doing is ensuring that there's always a visual component to the work they're doing. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't, I've never done any video, but I do think you're right that I would do well to learn it. <laughs> well, let's, make some bold predictions that will either be accurate or inaccurate next time we revisit this. Um, where do you think the future of podcasting is going? Um, time to take your big, bold bets. <laughs> LJ, what do you think? I'm first about the future. <laughs> um, I think that um, I feel really optimistic about the future because I feel like people are um, really starting to listen to podcasts more. It's become part of lots of different people, pretty much more and more people's lives. Um, so that's really exciting. Like, I feel like podcasting is kind of becoming more like magazine writing or TV. It's like a new medium that um, people have incorporated into their lives. So I don't see it going away. I feel like that's only a positive. Um, and I think that one thing that that means is as the industry grows and it becomes more professionalized, um, you know, also the, there'll be more jobs and um, I think the credits will change. I think something we talked, me and Aloise talked about is how 
it might become a little bit more like TV and movies. Like I think now since podcast start, podcasting started out so scrappy, you kind of think of the host as the writer, the producer, the engineer. Um, and as it becomes like a more lucrative and larger industry, um, that's no longer going to be the case. And people who write for podcasts are going to get more recognition. Sound engineers and composers and artists for podcasts, all of those are going to become, you know, those niche jobs are going to become more recognized and a bigger, more of a thing. And people, I think, will also become better listeners. And you won't necessarily listen to a podcast and be like, oh, this host is like, you know, such a great sound designer. <laughs> like you'll understand that it's a collaborative thing, like a movie that people have different roles in. Hmm. That's that's great, and I I think uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see the credits change as well. You know, on the music industry side, this has been something that uh, we used to have. You know, liner notes and albums, and you could see who the producers were and the songwriters and you know, the bass player and, you know, follow that. And then that got lost with Spotify and Pandora and, uh, and Apple music. And that's slowly coming back. So I think that's gonna be exciting to watch happen with podcasts too. Hmm. Eloise, um, sounds like you're in agreement with some of those points. Uh, yeah, no, I'm in agreement. This is, I think it's exciting to think that the, I mean, it's such a democratic medium. Anybody can, you know, pick it up, which is what's great about podcasting. But I think like, any art as it like sort of develops, um, like as society sort of acquires the, a taste for audio, um, I think that like things will change. Um, and I think, yeah, I think people will become sort of more attuned listeners. Um, and there, I guess my hope is that will mean that um, there's like appreciation for um, what goes into the process and quality and stuff like that. Um, I think that there's like a potential for podcasting to fill a lot of um, gaps that we're seeing in in like the uh, news world, like, you know, long form journalism is sort of has sort of gone away a little bit. And podcasting is something that has, you know, more money and people have more time to do um, in depth pieces. Um, and I don't know, we were, uh, LJ and I were talking about local news um, and how podcasting has the potential to sort of like fill that um, gap. So yeah, I think all of, all of what LJ said and, and more. Outstanding. Outstanding. Um, before I turn it over to our, we have some great questions coming in. Thank you, everybody. Um, keep the questions coming. I'll bring them up in one second. Um, while we're talking about the future, there are people that are watching this stream now and people that are going to be watching this stream that want to get into podcasting. Um, today is the day that they woke up and said, I, I want to do this, or maybe they've been doing it for years. You both have been like very successful at coming in through di different paths. What would you recommend for people and for viewers who want to work in podcasting? Um, I, I can take that first. Um, Welcome to podcasting, I would say. <laughs> it's an exciting industry to join. Um, I would say one thing that I suggest to people a lot when they ask me is um, to buy a kit. Um, you can Google, um, you know, what it's a good podcasting kit to get, like a, a Zoom recorder and maybe a Rhodes mic. Um, it's a bit of an investment, but I think if you want to be a podcaster, it's good to have a microphone and a recorder. Um, and then I would, you know, get out there and do some tape syncs, which is when you do a recording for a company. Um, and I think like any job and especially in media, it's a lot about building connections and relationships. So if you can start that by doing some freelance recordings here and there, um, then that's a really good way to get your foot in the door. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, free, definitely making your own stuff and um, getting comfortable with audio and then, yeah, freelancing where you can and um, just, yeah, sort of trying to be around the process of creating a podcast um, as much as possible. Um, I was even, I was like, yeah, we were both fact checking at a certain point. So um, yeah, that would be my advice too. Yeah. 
and be around, try and as much as you can, I guess, get coffees with and be around people who are making things because eventually they'll need something from you, chances are, <laughs> if you're willing to do it. And that's a great first step. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, on a more tactical note, um, do either of you have experience making uh, compilations of past episodes or maybe even um, trailers or teasers for episodes? Would love to hear a little bit more about um, how you've gone about that in the past. I haven't used Descript for that. Have you, LJ? Yeah, I haven't used I haven't used Descript for that because it's so recently that we've been using it. We don't actually have that much past content in Descript, but I'm sure that will change. Awesome. What what you were using Pro Tools before? Yeah, to create <laughs> to create t trailers. Yeah, okay. we would do that in in Pro Tools. Awesome. Yeah, my guess would be it would be similar. I mean, I would start by doing a similar thing, which is uh, sort of having all the the audio that you want and um, exporting a rough cut without scoring of it compile together. Um, but past episodes is interesting because I guess you would have to take out the scoring. You'd have to go back into the mix and. I mean, we've definitely, I'm working on a, we definitely do compilations of past episodes and repackage them for various things. Um, so like, I'm, yeah, I have, to, I have done that. And you do have to go back to the original mixes and sometimes change scoring or change dates or something. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I see a number of, um, let's see, a number of questions come, oh, hold on, sorry. My screen just jumped, there we go. Uh, yeah, I see a number of questions coming in about the editing process. Uh, what did rough cutting look like prior to uh, tools like Descript in, uh, in terms of time? So maybe you could talk about assembly of an episode, you know, using that um, rev to Google Docs to syncing it to Pro Tools to Google Docs to Pro Tools to Google Docs. Um, <laughs> what, what are the timelines on some of these things? Um, well, I'll say I'm more familiar maybe with the with the D script part of it and LJ is more familiar with the timing uh, rough cutting in Pro Tools, but um, I can pretty much rough cut uh, I can rough cut from um, a script in a day uh, for like a table read if I really have to <laughs> maybe like a long day um, but uh, that's not counting like pulling in tape and having it transcribed and the whole the whole editing process obviously is like months and months long and you know there's a whole reporting process too but once we actually have the script ready to go um the cutting isn't insanely time consuming yeah and for i think i would say like for descript when we um before descript when we were cutting usually like an hour long interview for a deep background into I would try and make it a half an hour using the Google Doc, using the Rev to Pro Tools to Rev. Like, I think it took me a full day. Um, I could obviously do it faster if it was breaking news and we had to do a turnaround, but to do a really nice, you know, cut that I'm proud of, I, it would take me a full day of work. Um, I only used it a few times using Descript, but I do think that the current producer who uses Descript all the time, I think it would probably be closer to half a day is the sense I get. But mm -hmm. I'm not, I can't, I might be fact checked on that, but that's what it seems like. Awesome, we will, uh, somebody on your team will fact check. <laughs> yeah. um, no, what about, uh, what about quantity of content um, you know, how much, how much content are we talking about? How many hours of tape go into a single show? Is there a, is there a metric that you go by? I think it depends on the show on revisionist history. Like there's certain episodes, which I think is maybe why I guess. Yeah. It depends on how, it depends how long cutting takes depending on the episode, honestly, because like if there's, if, 
if there's like nine interviews and nine pieces of archival tape, then that's going to take longer to pull together. Um, I think typically uh, we have like at least three interviews um, and like maybe four pieces of archival tape and that would be like a lighter episode. Um, but there's somewhere we have, um, yeah, there's somewhere we have more, more and <laughs> somewhere we have fewer, so. Yeah, and then it depends whether you cut the interview, whether you count the interviews that don't make the final cut, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think for our first episode, we're gonna have about five interviews. It hasn't been written yet, um, but I pulled in five interviews in Descript to pull from, and um, we'll see how many make it into the script. Awesome. Um, I actually have a couple of questions that have come in about the interview process and some people asking about um, whether they're using Descript to do it or the Descript screen recorder or an external tool. Um, what do you all use for conducting your remote interviews with guests and ensuring those get recorded? LJ? Um, so Michael does his interviews in studio. So the engineer records his end. And then the person he interviews actually, um, they connect over Zoom. So we always record a Zoom backup. Um, the engineer has saves a Zoom backup. And I usually also save a Zoom backup because I'm paranoid. And then the person he's interviewing uses an app called TalkSync, which you download onto your phone. And it kind of turns your phone into a microwave, like a microwave. <laughs> a microwave. <laughs> um, so I asked them to put it on a pile of books so it's close to their mouth. Um, and then they record themselves using that. And then they send me the audio after. I would say it works about 85% um, of the time. That's not because the app doesn't always work, it's because people aren't always able to successfully download the app onto their phone and then press and, record and then send and it. Then, <laughs> and, then, and for the 15%, do you rely on your backups? For the 15%, I rely on the backup, exactly. Got it. Awesome. Eloise, same process? Yeah, exactly the same. I'd say the only difference is if we're interviewing if it's like a really important interview for the project, we'll sometimes send them their own Zoom recorder. Um, but yeah, exact same process. And um, pre-pandemic, we would of course send someone right. to record the other person who's getting interviewed. And maybe we'll start doing that again. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yes, in, indeed. And uh, um, there, uh, we, ha we actually have something on the Descript blog that we wrote about when, uh, so, you know, you had mentioned Zoom. Um, Zoom has a high quality audio mode. So um, we actually kind of wrote a post about how you can do something over Zoom, but actually as long as both sides turn on this high quality audio mode, you are then capturing like almost lossless quality. Like it sounds indistinguishable from my local mic, um, the, the version that gets encoded with Zoom. Um, now the, the downside is that then we're still relying on an internet connection. So there can still be dropouts, there can still be drift. So it's a little, nothing is perfect. So as you said, everything is like 85%, um, uh, but, uh, it's, it's something else you can try to, um, uh, the, uh, noble warrior has an outstanding question that might itself be its own hour long webinar. Um, but do you have an overall framework for how you're gonna go about like, it, let's say you have you know three different interviews, how you're gonna try to weave them into a single narrative? Um, do you wanna go ahead, LJ? I guess I can, do, do you, I mean, I guess part of what we're doing is um, going off of at least on revisionist history, we're a lot of the time going off of what, what Malcolm has already done in the script, which is weaving together these different interviews he's conducted. Um, on my end, I have a system where I like will have them as separate compositions, and then um, they I'm, I have them appear as compositions in the order they appear um, in the episode, um, so that I you know n know where they are, um, and then. Yeah, I some and then I guess part of my job also is to like 
suggest um, uh, tape that wasn't pulled before in certain places. And I think that's just like something that I've learned a lot about from just watching um, watching everybody work at Pushkin and, um, you know, listening to the content of the narrative and to a lot of audio. So, yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of, um, I mean, that's kind of the, the art of making an audio story. Um, and I feel like people have different strategies. I worked with someone at the BBC who told me, <laughs> I think this is crazy, but she would get all of her tape and go into like a closet, like a really dark room with no like distractions and listen through all of it. And then mark down what stood up, like stood out to her. Um, and then she would kind of build her story around that, like the best tape. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do that because that's like, I don't know, I don't want to lock myself in a dark place for hours. Um, but when I was working on Takeover, um, the audiobook, I do go through all the scripts and put in red what I think is the best tape. And then I usually move that into a Google document. And then I start writing around the tape is how I start. Well, you, th that's awesome. So it sounds like you're going through, you're, you're maybe saving some of the text off in a Google doc. And so you are like thinking about it in terms of text as well. Yeah. I'm actually doing that too. And I'm doing it for like an upcoming project we have where we have like 10 hours of tape that I had, uh, I didn't get transcribed through Rev. I had it um, like automated through Descript. And um, I did my like selects uh, in Descript. So it's like, there's one composition of all of the selects, which is really cool. Cause you can just listen through them. Outstanding. Outstanding. So uh, I have I, I have a closing question. Um, it's from a, a, a user named Jay uh, who works at Descript. Um, okay, imagine you showed up to work tomorrow and Descript was gone. There was no more Descript. What would you do? <laughs> um, well, hopefully all of my projects are backed up. <laughs> um, so if they weren't, that would be a big problem. Um, but I guess I would, it would take a lot more time for me to, so right now I'm, what am I doing? I am uh, editing another version of a mix. And so I would be doing that in Pro Tools, like looking back and forth through a Google document. Um, yeah, and it would take more time, I think, so. Yeah, yeah, I would be, it would be annoying if it happened tomorrow because I'm supposed to prep for a table read that I have to pull clips for and I'm pretty sure I'll get 24 hours notice at some point in the next like three days. Um, so I have everything all ready to go into script for this moment. Um, so I would be sad to have to start over in Pro Tools and have to consolidate all the transcripts and, um, yeah. Yeah, it's just a lot more. It, it takes away a lot of the time consuming um, elements of like uh, putting, you know, text to audio. It used to be that we we had to do that like with our own brains and now there's the software doing it for us, which is, yeah. Exactly. Like it would mean I would have to go through like five hours worth of sound waves trying to figure out where a particular quote was that I needed to pull for a table read. Mm -hmm. Well, Good news, the script will be here for a very, very long time. <laughs> and um, and thanks, thanks to both of you and your feedback and your teams and Pushkin for advancing the state of the art for audiobooks and for podcasts. Um, and again, for, for both of you for just being wonderful creators to bring stories that need to be told to all of us that could use a little extra distraction in our days. So. Thank you again for uh, giving so generously with your time today. Thanks for some of the insights that you've shared with the community. Um, if people want to learn more about Pushkin, where can they uh, where can they find more or subscribe? Um, Pushkin.fm. <laughs> Pushkin.fm, and we have a um, we have a newsletter that you can sign up for. Outstanding. We will we will make sure to post the link in the feed. 
everybody, thank you. Well, well there, there it is right there. Uh, everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, just some uh, informational things. If you have additional questions, some of you wrote in with some like technical questions on Descript, totally cool. Um, go to help.descript.com, that's our help center. And exactly, and so on the help center, there's actually a little chat bubble in the bottom right. Uh, click on that and that is the live chat. We actually have people, our support team right there, right now, uh, able to help you out with your questions. Um, you are very welcome for hosting this. We also appreciate the information. Uh, thank you all for showing up today. Eloise, LJ, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for having us. Bye all, see you soon. Bye.